Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Busting the Myths, the Myth Buster section for Core Blood Connect. Very happy to have you all here. Um, should be a great panel today and a panel discussion with my esteemed colleagues up here who I'll introduce in just a moment. We're going to go through several different topics that cover a wide range of areas through really the core blood industry, both from the public side, the family side, research, uh, regulatory. It's a, it's a wide range of different myths that we'd like to bust and provide some truths on. And I think, you know, for those who are newer to the conference, there's a lot of information out there. And having the ability to share some light behind why people might think certain things around these topics and then the truth behind them, that's the goal here today. So we'll go through a number of different topics and at the end we are gonna save some time for some Q&A and if you've got a good myth that you think is out there that you've heard before, please save it and we'll see if we can uh, bust it at the end of this conversation. So with that, we'll jump into who we have here on the panel today and I'll do just a brief bio introduction of, of all the folks here. Just by way of introduction for myself, so my name is Peter Baywin, a board, proud board member of the CBA. I work at, Corbla, at uh, excuse me, I work at Cooper Surgical, who does run Core Blood Registry, a family bank in the United States. So to my right, I'll go through the list of my esteemed colleagues up here. So first up is Dr. Colleen Delaney. She is a scientific founder and Chief Scientific Officer and Executive Vice President of Research and Development at Devera Therapeutics. That's a cellular therapeutic company. And additionally, she's the Chief Scientific and Medical Officer, I'm gonna probably mispronounce this correct, incorrectly, Queptis Therapeutics. And she's also a stem cell transplant physician and affiliate and former professor at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. She received her MSc from Oxford University or MD from Harvard Medical School. Welcome, Colleen. Thanks for joining us. Uh, next up is Roger Horton down there on the end. He is the FACT Director in, of the Anthony Nolan Cord Blood Bank and cell, and cell and Head of Clinical Innovation and Partnerships at the Anthony Nolan Center Therapy Center in Nottingham, UK. He has more than 17 years of experience in the field of core blood, stem cell, cell cellular therapy, and leukemia as part of the core blood support program in the UK. Welcome, Roger. Thanks for joining us. Marcy Finney, uh, as an MS and MBA, Executive Director from the Cleveland Core Blood Center. With over 20 years of experience, she's played a pivotal role in educating our medical personnel, supporting families, and driving the growth of core blood applications. She holds an executive MBA from Weatherhead School of Management at Case Western Reserve University, complementing her Master's of Science in Chemistry. So she brings a well-rounded uh, both business and clinical side to this panel. So welcome, Marcy. Next up is Kate Gerard. She has worked in the stem cell banking and research field for over 20 years. She has a clinical background in obstetrics as a labor and delivery nurse and has a master's degree in women's health and nursing. She has authored many peer-reviewed articles related to core blood and core tissue. She works at Viacord Revity, and she's the director of clinical market development. So welcome, Kate. Fran Verder, who I know many of you know, she is founder of the Parents Guide to Core Blood, which she founded in 1998 in memory of her daughter. She started her career as a research scientist, earning a BS in, in physics from Brooklyn College and a PhD in astrophysics from Princeton University. So she started Parents Guide to Core Blood and brings a wealth of knowledge around research, which some of you probably saw uh, throughout the presentations even earlier today. So welcome, Fran. And then last and not least, you see on the board, there's the missing person, and that is Erica Nahar. She was part of this panel, but unfortunately was unable to make it to the conference, but was a very strong participant, and so we we'll welcome her. She's had a decade plus at NMDP and is a senior manager, customer ready products at NMDP. So thank you to Erica for your support in putting this all together. All right, so with that, Let's talk about just any conflicts of interest here. I'll put them up on the screen versus read them all for everybody here. And we'll move on. So in terms of our show here today, these are the topics that you know we're gonna cover on behalf of the industry. So we're gonna have some myths related to parents, business and industry, public banking, family banking, 
registry, transplants, and medical applications. I feel like I'm reading a Jeopardy board here and someone should call out uh, one Let's of the categories. Parents for 2000. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that would have been fun. Maybe that's a inspiration for next year. We're going to we're going to do that. Um, all right. So first and foremost, we're going to go around the horn here. Um, Roger, I'm going to start with you with our first myth. Cord blood transplants are hard to do. Okay, um, <clears throat> first things first, sorry for catfishing with the photograph. I used to have more hair the last time I had a camera anywhere near me. Um, secondly, you heard from Rob Wynn yesterday, and he, he did say that cord transplant can be difficult to do, but I would caveat that in that it's difficult to do in isolation. So if you've not done one in a long time, or your center's not a cord blood center, and you go into it blind, then yes, it will be difficult. If you can utilize uh, the knowledge of colleagues or registry support services or other support services that are available within your country, then not so much. So best example I can give you of that is about three, four months ago in the UK, we had a transplant center uh, approach us with some questions about a cord unit search. They got a couple of units, the post or data was looking a bit off, and they literally hadn't touched cord in nearly 20 years. So they went through our post or clinic. We gave them some advice on the data and said, those are okay, let's go. But then we offered some more services and said, actually, would you like to run through a webinar with one of the clinicians that we used? Uh, so you can look at kind of what to look for for late effects. What sort of things do I need to do in terms of conditioning the patient? And then we thought, hang on a minute, what about the nurses? So the nurses on ward in this place, again, wouldn't have touched cord blood in decades. So we said, do you want us on site? We'll come down with some, some practice units under that kind of fact umbrella of, of practice units, uh, which actually turned out to be some cord blood bags filled with Ribena because they're easier to do. Um, so we went down two days before. We spoke to two of the, the nursing team. They had a go at thawing out these practice units in the water bath. They refreshed their SOP on cord thawing and infusion, got it all signed off by the quality team, and then we came back to support them again on day of infusion. And that was more just from a kind of a, a moral support point of view, because by that point, they knew what they were doing. They were happy. They were confident. Patient was infused. Um, one slight hitch. We did say they can experience nausea at point of transplant. I think, unfortunately, the patient might have had quite a large breakfast. But other than that glitch, uh, everything went according to plan. Um, and we heard back from them that the patient, in fact, engrafted in 21 days. And they are well. Fantastic. Thanks, Roger. Can I, can I ask something? Please. Or just say that, that that's just beautiful. Yeah. I mean, I just have to say that it's wonderful that you can provide that level of support. Mm -hmm. And maybe this isn't the forum for, but I so want to know how you have the resources to do that. But I just, kudos to you guys, truly. Um, we're all doing it to save lives, so thanks. It, it's taken a while to get there, and you'd be surprised at how little resource there is in it. <laughs> but it works. Fantastic. Switching gears, we're going to move on to public banking. So, Marcy, there's a myth around core blood banks only serving local communities and the misconception that they only work within their immediate geography, their immediate geographic area. Truth? No, I don't think that's true. But it, it is a challenge, right, in the industry. There aren't, well, I think there's two sides to that about collections, right, and then distribution. So I'll start with collections, right? So I think that... At one point, it was pretty geographically driven, and even for our bank, we first started with collection sites in Cleveland. But we recognized that part of our mission was to make sure that they, we had a cord blood in our inventory for everyone, right? So we recognized that it would make more sense for us to be in different geographic locations. So our particular bank has collection sites in Cleveland, Atlanta, Georgia, and in the East Bay in California. That was probably driven by some funding opportunities, I'll be honest, but we it, it was thoughtful that we wanted to have units from across the country in the thought that if we had them from across the country, we could better serve all the people that live here. Um, what, and I think there's many banks that have sites that are geographically distant from themselves. We've worked out the shipping and what that looks like, and we're FDA licensed and accredited, and it works well. Um, and thanks to all the shipping uh, companies out there that help us do that. I think the other side of the coin is when we started our bank, right, we didn't really know what distributions might look like. And to be truthful, we haven't 
had that many transplants from our public core blood bank that have been done in Ohio. But what we did see was many more that went even outside of the U.S. We have about 15% of our cord bloods that go outside of the U.S. So I think we have sent to 40-some um, states and 17 countries. So I think the output has also been a little different than what we anticipated. Excellent. Great. Thank you. We're going to move on to applications of future use and research. So there's a myth that many believe that cord blood is only valuable for stem cell transplant, not as ideal starting material for creating advanced biotherapies. Colleen, would you like to address that myth? Eh, no, just <laughs> false. Um, I think the sad thing to me is I think most people here really know that that's not true, um, in this audience anyway, and really we need to be um, spreading this far and wide. Um, at every conference we go to that's not cord blood specific. So I, I, it's clearly false. Uh, I think, to be honest, when I first started using cord blood as a source of material to do an expanded stem cell product, it, it was indeed supposed to be for transplant. Um, so I was kind of following that, that myth, right? But I think since then, and since uh, the public banks have become FDA licensed, cord blood represents an invaluable source of starting material for uh, developers doing cord blood-derived immunotherapies, regenerative medicine, whether it's cord tissue, cord blood, there's Treg applications, there's NK applications, there's um, NK from cord blood CD34 applications. You'll hear some uh, work from our group tomorrow on deriving monocytes from CD34 cord blood. So, I mean, it absolutely is, is not true, um, and I think that as someone who's in a small struggling biotech, when I talk to investors, they, they really don't understand though. And I think it's important for us to continue to spread knowledge, preclinical work, the clinical applications that are happening. They all think that cord blood, first of all, they don't even, when I say cord blood, I, if I don't say umbilical, they don't know what I'm talking about. They think iPSCs or adult derived donors are really the only two donor sources. But we have at our access you know, hundreds of thousands of units potentially, right, for use. Um, and you'll hear from all my banking friends, and right, it's really about a matter of turning up the, the spigot or the collections if we really hit a home run on something. Thankfully, right now, you know, we're not at risk of running out because our applications are not in the tens of thousands of patients, right? We're in more orphan type um, diseases, but it is. I mean, it's absolutely not true. It's a beautiful, only regulated source of starting material that's out there. Um, so I, I'll stop there. Great, great, great commentary. I appreciate that. And maybe in a relatable way, we'll switch to, to family banking and a topic around utility. So Kate, there's a myth around privately or family banked units not being able to be used from a clinical perspective based on size of sample. Could you address that myth? Sure. So I think it does play very well off uh, what Colleen was just saying in that, um, you know, we don't have the same cell count cutoffs or, lim or limitations or restrictions um, that a public bank does where they can, you know, they choose to bank the larger units. These families have one time, um, one child and one opportunity and we get what we get and we do the best possible job quality wise to cryopreserve those cells and have them available. Now, the judgment of small or big or whatever size is only based on transplant reference, because that's what we have, right? So, um, you know, while they may be small, they, they are still being used. We release units regularly for transplant. Um, they can be used often in, um, in some clinical settings. They're used with bone marrow from the same exact match sibling, but the value of having that cord blood um, available for the family is still very relevant and the and doctors are choosing to use it. Um, we're uniquely suited to do uh, directed donation collections and that we collect anywhere the mom is. And so if there's a situation where they have a child that's at high risk for needing a transplant, we um, have a program called Sibling Connection where we can facilitate the collection of any full sibling um, at no cost and make sure that that cell source is available should the child move to transplant. Um, and then the other side of the coin is that uh, I have to say I feel like the vast majority of families who choose to bank their um, their cord at a family bank um, 
many of them aren't thinking about transplant. Um, they're thinking about future advanced therapies. They're thinking about having a resource available um, that may be uh, useful for their family's medical future, you know, decades down the line. Um, so it's very hard to say what small is in that point. Maybe it will be too small, but we don't know. All we know is there's only one opportunity to bank it. Thanks, Kate. Related to that topic and utility of the actual therapeutic and the, and the actual core blood unit, maybe we'll talk to Fran about a perception within the industry and a relatable piece to sample size is delayed cord clamping, which is something that parents are often wondering about. It comes up more and more from a consumer perspective as they think about birth choices. And there's a, a commentary, you could call it a myth, that midwives keep preaching a quote unquote, wait for white, leading parents to believe that if they wait long enough, all the blood from the umbilical cord will go back into the baby. Care to address that myth? Yeah, well, I, I seeded this question because uh, um, I deal with it a lot. And there is a website called Wait for White, which was set up by a, a midwife, although the content is not current. It's like 10 years old. But it's, you know, preaching this whole idea that all of the blood belongs to the baby, the baby needs all of the blood, which is a debatable topic, and then all of the blood will go back into the baby if you wait long enough. And the third is absolutely false and a myth. Um, yes, there are situations where you can get cord blood into the baby and the umbilical cord will turn white because there's no blood left in it, but that's not the rule. Um, there are numerous things taking place at the time of birth. I mean, for example, in a C-section, uh, there are no uterine contractions, uh, and you need the uterine contractions to push blood out of the placenta into the baby. So without uterine contractions, waiting is not gonna accomplish anything. Um, there's also a biological fact that a lot of people don't know about unless you're involved in birth, like as, as, as a profession, that when a baby takes its first breath, you know, not only does it pull blood to its lungs, but also there's a constriction of the artery that goes uh, into the umbilical cord. And so blood stops going from the baby to the, the cord, which kind of interrupts the whole flow process. Um, and position of the baby also matters. Like if you want to get everything into the baby, you need to hold the baby below the placenta, whereas mothers like to have their baby on their chest after birth. I mean, that's the normal, you know, instinctive thing to do, and that's the wrong position for pumping all that blood back into the baby. So it, it's not likely to happen, and, and what I try to preach to parents, I, I am careful not to dismiss delayed clamping or, or to poo-poo it, I, I, I just, say, hey, go for balance, go for an intermediate amount of delay so that you can do both. You know, you can get a little more blood into the baby, but you can also bank some blood. So I'm always trying to teach moderation. Is it okay if I end up? Please. We often echo that in the public space too, right? We say that it's not an either or choice for, for our space and that we tell um, families that they need to balance, right? The longer you delay clamp, the less likely it is that you'll, the cord blood collection will be big enough for a clinical use. So, you know, we don't, we don't want uh, families to get in that trying to, t to pick either or. I can't speak for the pediatrics about whether the baby needs the blood or not, and we don't want to get into that, but I think it's a good message. Oh, jo Joanne, go ahead. We do want to get into that. You yeah. don't want to put all the blood back in the baby. You will put the baby in heart failure. You will give the baby hyperbilirubinemia. I'm not kidding. I mean, it is medically not indicated to put all the blood in the baby. And we're not term. supposed to hold the baby down because that's what will happen, and the baby will be sick. So I just want to be clear, there's nuances on court delayed clamping, but it's not having the baby down there and letting all the blood go back in the baby. Yeah, and that's really bad for the baby. As a pediatric resident, I can tell you many times I was on call and asked to come basically blood let a baby whose hematocrit was too high because of what Joanne's talking about. And no parent wants to see their kid stuck if you can't get something in the umbilical vein again to withdraw blood. So it, it is an issue. A full-term baby doesn't need the blood. And we need some information from pedi pediatrics that we can also relate. 
Yeah. <laughs> so Sorry. I have some cool data. If I can bring some data to this delayed clamping party, uh, we sit in a very unique position where we collect data from the OBs or who, Medwave or whoever's doing the collection, and we ask, did you delay clamping? If so, how long? And then we can look at the cords after and see how big they are, and then we can stratify across. And so I did this analysis in 2017, and I did it again recently. I have not put it in an abstract or anything, so this is just me talking off of what I, the data I pulled. But we've looked at over 60,000 cords at this point. So my, our N is significant, and I can tell you, um, the first thing I want to talk about is that um, I've seen a, a little bit of a shift. When we first looked at it, we saw that, you know, how many people said they weren't clamping or delaying at all? Were you delaying under a minute, one to three, or over three? And what we've seen in the past, between 2017 till now, is that there's been a big movement towards um, under one minute which is the ACOG suggestion of 30 to 60, all right? So uh, it was 42%, I think, originally in 17, and now it's 65%. And that has pulled up from the no delay. Some people who were doing no delay are now in the delaying under a minute. But the over three minutes and the greater three, those have gone way down as well. So everyone's kind of moving into that, you know, um, ACOG recommendation. And then looking at the correlated cord blood collections, what I can say is that there's been no huge shift between the data we looked at at 17 and 24. So even if people are moving between compartments, the, 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 it looks the same. What we have noticed is that we've had an average of a one milliliter decrease in average collection volume every year for the past 10 years. So our average collection volume is now 10 milliliters less than it was 10 years ago. It's been very slow and steady, you know, one milliliter um, a year. And the other fun fact I'll throw out before we stop is that I can tell you if you look at the no delay to the um, under one minute delay, the average impact that that has is about nine milliliters of blood and it's about 147 million TNC. So it's there, but it's not a single point of failure, I would say. So Very I'll publish it. Good data, we'd like to see that published, I think. It would help us, but I think, you know, even given Fran's commentary on the, you know, the website that's out there, there's a lot of misinformation, as we know, in this category in general, but specifically around delayed cord clamping, it has a lot of organic presence through social media and other areas, so having that counterbalance, and thanks for, Joanne, for stepping in on that commentary, too, that would be valid information parents should know about, because it's, it's truly a misconception, and good to know the facts that are out there, so thanks. All right, switching gears a little bit from delayed quarter clamping, we'll go back to usage to a degree. And, and Roger, you probably, this has been a, a topic that's come up throughout, I think, the presentations, but as it relates specific to transplants, myth or fact, core blood usage is declining? Uh, myth, depending on where you look. <laughs> <laughs> So, so yeah, there is geographical variation, and we've seen that this morning in some of the presentations we've had. One caveat I'd like to put on it before I say any more is that you actually have to be quite careful about the data that you're looking at in that a lot of cord data is presented as the number of cords transplanted. Everything else is the number of patients, but you can have double cord. In the UK, we've seen a significant drop-off in double cord transplant in favor of single because we're finding good quality decent units to use for single transplant, which is just less complicated if you can get a good one for your patient. So the number of patients in the UK has been consistent actually since COVID. So in 2018, there were 58 patients in the UK treated with cord blood. Uh, we put in the cord support stuff and we tried to build that. Obviously, COVID was a big driver for cord usage because donors were dropping out at the last minute. And so we had a backup cords program ready to go so if a donor did drop we could we could bring in a cord quickly but what we've managed to do is then maintain that since then so we're still doing a steady sort of 100 patients a year for the last four years in a row but the number of cords has gone from 142 at the highest in the uk at the height of covid down to 123 last year for exactly the same number of patients so when you're seeing in the wmda data it going from 2530 to 2330 is that a decrease in patient treatment or is that a decrease in double core transplant is the caveat I'd put on that. So yeah, I, I very much think it depends on, on where you're looking and, and what you're doing and how much advocacy is out there in a given region or, you know, Japan's got quite unique characteristics so it lends itself to cord blood transplant. Um, from what we heard from Fran, it works really well in China, maybe for similar sort of reasons. But equally, if there's nobody out there saying, 
don't forget, Cord's got unique biological properties, it's a really useful graft, then it will, it will, it will dry up because of the, the sexy science as we've called it several times today. There was always something newer, shinier. Right. So, yeah. Great. Thanks, Roger. Relatable to that and maybe prior to the prior topic as well on future use and applications and maybe utility of, of the actual asset. Colleen, there's a myth around you know the expense and use for, for complex therapies. And so some people assume that you know the cells derived from core blood are too simple and basic and maybe too expensive to be used in the creation of complex biotherapies. Myth or fact? Yeah, I, d I definitely don't. I think it's a myth with, again, I guess with some caveats too, right? Um, you know, cord blood, just like iPSCs and healthy adult donors are not gonna be useful for every application. So we can't just take an application and say, you know, we're gonna do all this or all this or all this. Um, but I think what's often neglected it, are misconceptions around how do I get cord blood? I think that's the, so we have to start at the people who are doing the research, right? The basic research and trying to develop these products and have an idea and maybe want to go to a cord um, because cord cells are more proliferative. I, I, that, there's lots and lots of published data around how proliferative these cells are, how amenable they are, how easy they are to work with. But if you're a young researcher and you're at an institution that doesn't have access to cords and you try to get access to cords, you will very quickly jump to that belief that they're too expensive, too hard, too difficult, all of those things, right? Because now you're gonna be trying to find something for research, they want you to pay for the cores, you wanna, all these different things, right? So I think the first thing is making cord, you know, available for research, right? Would be a, a, a huge step forward to dispelling some of that myth. But once you get beyond that, um, I always quote Joanne, cord blood is not just a bag of stem cells, right? It's, it's not just a bag of stem cells. Um, and there's cord tissue as, as well. So I think there's also a misunderstanding that it's only stem cells or it's only you know, X, Y, and Z, or it's gonna cost me $65,000 every time I wanna use a unit of cord blood for, as a developer. And that's just not true either. So I think it's, and I literally just got asked this question from someone who I was kind of surprised. They're like, oh, but if we do cord blood, if we use cord blood as our starting material, it's gonna cost me $50,000 a unit. And I was like, no, no, it's not. <laughs> so I think um, that is largely all myth. Uh, I think it is not a complicated source of cells to use. I think it's more complicated to get uh, for younger research researchers. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Great. Sorry, could, could I add to that briefly Please as well? I, I think you've got to bear in mind as well, for therapy developers, what's scalable? So we, we've had some people interact with us working on sort of um, bone marrow because it, it's the best source, but it's like, how are you going to scale that to hundreds or thousands a year? Have you tested the different grafts? And, and okay, maybe cord blood gives you 10% less yield on what you're getting, but I could provide you with up to 6,000 of those a year from the collection centers. You're not going to get that out of a bone marrow harvest, or, or vice versa, PBSCs, because the apheresis centers, at least in the UK, are full. So it's, it's accessibility and kind of considering the range. And as you say, price is price. Is price. A transplant price is a transplant price. Mm -hmm. uh, access for research is, is a different kettle of fish. It's different requirements. Thank you for bringing that up, because that actually, it's a, it's a hugely important point. And we're also getting as we understand more biologically about how cells work and conditions to grow them and all of that, um, there are different ways to scale, to your point, right? So I, and what we do, we can't use adult-derived cells, so I can't use bone marrow, I can't use PBSC, CD34 cells. They don't expand the way cord blood cells expand in our hands. So the beauty is we can expand, and then we can use that, ex we can leverage the expansion to then make other cell therapies, NK cells, monocytes, whatever. Um, but there are many, many groups out there working, you're gonna hear about this tomorrow as well, right, who can use one single cord blood unit and make lots and lots and lots of doses. So um, I think people get scared by the volume, right, especially you get 25 cc's, right, a frozen unit. Um, so they're scared by the volume, they're scared by the fact that, you know, there's only median of what, two to four million CD34s in, in, a, in a bank on average, right? So some people might need larger ones, some, but there are ways to scale. 
And the other way to scale is by pooling, which is what we do. Um, but that's only applicable in certain applications, right? But, but thank you for bringing that up, Roger, because it's hugely important. Expansion technologies are, are really improving, as are other ways to expand starting material, you know, NK cells, et cetera. Excellent. And I actually like one other piece you hit on beyond expansion. You talked about core tissue for a moment. You know, back to the delayed core clamping conversation, I think that's another interesting angle is to think about if someone is dead set on delayed clamping, hopefully to the appropriate number of minutes only, that that's another alternative, you know, resource potentially for a family as well. I'm going to change gears a little bit. So we have something called our wild card, wild card category, which is a surprise for the panel because I didn't tell them about this in advance, but it's, it's from our esteemed colleague, Erica, who's not here. So... I'm going to jump into one of the myth areas that she brought up from an NDP perspective. So there's a misconception that cord blood banks are excellent at managing their inventories. Their roles in driving interest and demand for the cord blood units is often overlooked. The idea is here that cord blood banks are sitting on these valuable resources without actively working to make them more accessible or useful. Is that really true? Anyone like to, to, to grab that one? Either one of us can tell you. Maybe both. First. Okay. Uh, no. <laughs> You've heard me talk about cord support, right? I mean, I, I, do, I do get it. Like, normally a, a pharmaceutical drug would have a drug rep who would go out and would do this. And it's, it's not something that's particularly been done for cord blood. And, and we don't quite do it in that way. It's more about it's easier to use if you do this, this, and this. But also there's the cell and gene therapy side that we've been doing now since 2016 in a formal fashion longer than that beforehand because uh, as, as other people have mentioned public banks we utilize about 20 percent for transplant but the mums have donated that other 80 percent to do something good the intent for altruism is there so we try and use as much as possible that might be it could be simple as in-house machine qualifications and validations it can be uh, clinical trials it can be academic research it can be uh, supplying advanced therapy starting materials so absolutely not it just depends on how proactive a given bank is, at which point I will hand over to a very proactive. I, I totally agree, right? And I think, I wish Peter Marks was still here, right? It's, we have the only approved FDA products that don't have a sales force, right? You know, most people, when they get their BLA, they've hit the jackpot, yeah. right? Because now they have a product that's able to be out and be sold, right? And, but that's not the way it works in our industry. We've had all of the hard parts of having a licensed product, right? But we didn't really get, no one could raise their price when we got our BLAs, right? Because the usage has kind of stayed steady. But I think what we can do is, you know, I think the banks also would feel a little, uh, I think it would feel self-serving if we went out and started trying to um, drum up business for using cord blood as transplant. But that's why the banks lean on places like the CBA and the new National Cord Blood Network to help get the word out about cord blood as a use for transplant. I think what we have been able to control, um, and I know our bank did this pre-COVID and thought about, we saw that it was plateauing and what could we do as a bank, things that we could control, right? We can't go out and um, talk about using it for transplant, but what we can do is think about how we could support developers and people that are starting to use cord blood for new therapies. So we started, we used to track all of our matrix were based on how many cords went out for transplant that month. And we had on our bulletin board and that was all we looked at. But what we decided to also think about was our utilization rate. So we had so many cords coming in, we only banked so many, but what could we do with all of those other cords that were there, right? They're still really useful and I shouldn't say it so curtly, but no one donates their cord blood to us for us to throw it away or for it to sit in the freezer for 20 years. You know, people want us to do something with it. So we and all the banks have taken a lot of uh, resources and effort to make sure that we connect with developers and, you know, have a sort of sliding scale for do you need research units, do you need something that looks and feels like a clinical unit, but it's not. And I tell my team, you know, it's hard on us when we have only one or two units go out for transplant, right? That's hard to see that that usage is going down. But with 
I would be really worried about is if we don't have anybody calling us looking for research units, because that means that no one's looking for new therapies for court, right? We might not have a big payoff now, but we're hoping to grow with those developers. You know, maybe we provide them with research units in the academic setting, and then once they get out into, you know, trying to do an IND, we can support them then, and we can follow them all the way along that path, so. Is that a trend line that's increasing? It is for From us. A request? That's yeah, great to hear. It is for us. That's great. Maybe related to that, our, our second question in the wildcard category is the licensure status of cord blood units determining the quality and, and suitability for transplant. Myth or fact? Or, or, or fact? For transplant? Mm -hmm. I, we don't look at that, um, to be frank. Uh, we look first at what's the best unit that's available for our patient by whatever the criteria is that the center uses. But we, that is certainly not in the, is it licensed? Like, like that's not the first thing we look at. Is it licensed or unlicensed, right? And, and in fact, I will say, maybe I shouldn't say, I, I will say that um, some of my younger colleagues, my transplant physician colleagues, in fact, don't even know <laughs> what the difference is, right? So when they are on service and they are doing a cord blood transplant, of which we do many, um, I really try my hardest when I'm there to educate everyone on, on what that means because we, we have these sheets that go along with the, it's like a roadmap for the patient. And it'll say on there whether it's licensed or unlicensed. So I like to play a, a game and say, do you guys know what that means? And really, the only difference is that one is obtained under an IND and one is not obtained under an IND. Um, and... Yeah, so I, there, as far as using it for transplant, I really don't, that is not true at all. There really is no difference. I mean, I think quality, I think we've gotten better, we, I, we, that's the royal we, that's not me, have gotten better at like, you know, collecting larger units, having more HLA typing, looking more, and my colleagues looking more at the influence of CD34 instead of TNC. So I think overall, cordless transplants really have gotten tremendously better and we see that in the clinical outcomes and we see that in all the data you guys are seeing here. So, but I don't, that's, I think licensure helped with that, but I don't think it's dependent on it. Yeah, I would also say from a bank perspective that what's inside the bank, bag itself, the product itself, probably didn't change very much, right? So it's still useful for transplant, but what is better now is all of the things that go around it, right? The quality system that's around it. So. A cord blood unit that we banked in 2008 in Cleveland, uh, before we had our license, we could find all of the data that goes with that unit. It would take a long time to find the training for that doctor that did it, to find the EM monitor. We probably didn't even have it then, right? So there are things that we didn't have the qualification for the hood that it was in and know exactly who processed it. We could find all that it would take going to 452 binders to find that information, right? Now, a licensed unit that we made in 2018 or, or after, that's all in the batch record, and we can find it immediately. So I think the contents of the bag probably haven't changed very much, to Colleen's point, but all of the quality systems around it are so much better, and we have it at our fingertips, and we know where it all is. So I think I would say that's the practical. Well, in fact, I don't know if Karen's here. I saw Karen Bell somewhere. But um, in fact, she, you, there was a paper published on looking at the outcomes for license and all that. Am I correct? That's great, thanks. Yeah, so I think, and yeah, maybe it's time to, to relook at that to dis dispel that myth further. I guess the one thing I would add about licensed and unlicensed is as we get better at biotherapies, um, there may be, there may be some desire from developers to use licensed units. We have not had that, we haven't really done that yet, but there could be desire to, for, for exactly what Marcy was talking about. Great, thank you. Switching gears yet again, we're gonna go back to Fran. So in terms of, you know, some of the research, you know, it's a common trend we've been talking about. And again, what parents are faced with in a world of 
lots of information, some misinformation, and it's probably not just only to this category, but anywhere in anything you're looking up these days. So as it relates to research with core blood and core tissue, you know, there's a lot of negative media coverage on both public or family banking, and that negative media attention has translated to a number of, you know, the falling number of core blood transplants in the West and led some parents to believe that no work, no research is actually happening or being done on core blood anymore. Myth or fact? Well, that's a myth. That, that's a myth. Um, this, was, this was part of the negativity that came out of the uh, New York Times article. Um, I'm, I'm sure all of us who deal with parents got a fair number of, of parent inquiries and opinions. And um, one of the parents I was talking to who was like keenly interested in cord blood because she had an older child with an, an indication for use, um, and after reading the New York Times article, she was upset, and she hadn't talked to me in like a few years, but she contacted me again, and she was saying, oh, it looks like nobody's using cord blood, there's no interest in cord blood, and I'm like, whoa, you know, not, not true. Um, the number of clinical trials per year with cord blood or with birth tissues is the same now as it was before the pandemic. Um, during the pandemic, it went up dramatically. There was a huge use of, for example, MSC from, from umbilical cord uh, as a COVID treatment. So it was like a huge bump and doubled. Uh, but currently, the rate of research in terms of the number of trials per year is the same as it was before. So, you know, research is ongoing. People are interested. The nature of the research is evolving with time. Um, this is the kind of work that Colleen does, but a lot of the hematology, oncology applications of cord blood now in trials, you know, not the standard clinical treatment, but the trials are 86% of the trials from the past five years are using a specific cell type that was manufactured from cord blood. A lot of NK, but not just NK, it's like an alphabet soup of, of things that have been derived from cord blood, so, yeah. Great, thank you. So as we look at utility, uh, one of the questions that you know, we often see is that core blood banks don't screen donations. So some people think on the, really the public side that if they're not properly screened, could lead to unusable or unsafe donations and ultimately impacting future utility of and releases. Is that a fact or is that a myth? It's a myth, but I think it's true. Both public and private. I Seems think you get it from both sides. Shoot yourself in the foot if you don't do that right up front. So maybe we could hear both perspectives. Yeah, I mean, in the public space, right? We have huge, different uh, regulations from the private side, and uh, they go through so much testing and so much um, uh, quality systems that that it's a huge myth. So. From a private or yeah, family perspective? But, so the health history questionnaire um, questions are standardized. Uh, so we use the same type of screening as far as risk factors around that. Um, the infectious, maternal infectious disease panels are also standardized. So those are done the same way. Um, and you just, it, it, if you're compliant with the regulations, you're following all the changes, you know, the recent, you know, um, changes to Zika or what, you know, there's always it's, uh, things that are evolving. But if as long as you stay current with it, your screening should be top-notch and top of mind at the front of every collection. Great. And then related to that, on the public banking side, there's a, you know, there could be a belief or a misconception that public core blood banks have an endless storage capacity and can accept any donation they receive. Myth or fact? <laughs> That's a myth, too. I think it, it's changed over time, too, right? I feel like banks that were in growth phases, right, uh, five or 10 years ago is different now, right? So we have limited resources, we have limited capacity, and so, and there's also limited need at the, at the juncture we're at right now. So I think um, you could be in a growth phase with your inventory, you could be at a maintenance phase, and you know, you can be, there's banks now that don't collect at all. So I think that that's, a, that's an individual bank decision based on supply and demand. I think probably most banks are kind of in a, um, maintenance position, and that's kind of where my, our bank is. We are still collecting, we're still adding to the inventory, but probably not at that huge rate that we were before. If something changed where our output was different, then we could actually change that very, very easily. We haven't changed the input or our collections. We've actually grown it, but what we keep is really the top specific 
um, goals for our in particular inventory. Great. And that concludes our wide range of, of topics. And so from here in our last you know, 12 minutes or so, love to open it up to the audience to see what questions the group might have for our panel up here. Any myths that you, know, you interact with in your specific areas that you'd like this panel to weigh in on? The floor is, is yours. And there's two microphones on both, both alleyways here. Here we go. So um, sharing experience from where we come from Africa, okay? We're multi-ethnic, whereas impossibility to find an HLA match donor. And core blood is 100% match when we say it is private banking or autologous. So I see that the positive part that nobody tackles 100% is why go for haploid or mismatch and people can have a 100% match, especially in a multi-ethnic group where you cannot find an HLA. Why this specific part of this, the, the strength of core blood is not always tackled in any speech. I don't find it as the optimum choice, despite it is a 100% match. Who on the panel would like to address that one? <laughs> Johan, our auxiliary member of the panel. <laughs> So thank, thank you. you friend. If the baby, for example, develops malignancy and needs a transplant, their cord blood probably contains malignant cells and it will not give them graft versus leukemia because it's their cells, their immune system. If the baby has a genetic condition that needs correction, unless you can do gene therapy on the cord blood, which may come, but right now is not being practiced, you need different cells to do the gene therapy on. So there there are medical reasons why your own cord blood may not be your best donor source. Yes, but for the case of Fancuni anemia, or we had a similar case yeah. in Egypt with Skid, when a brother could give to his brother with, oh. or a sister with a higher possibility of a match. Yeah. And this is a, a, but, a greater advantage, I guess. Yeah, that's great. And that's what we call directed donor. And that's what Kay was talking about, yeah. that, that Revity Biocord has a program for that. So yeah, in a sibling setting where they may be a match, or even if they're a haplo, the cord of the sibling, if healthy and without the same disease, is a great choice. Yeah. Thank you so much. Were you also asking <laughs> why does anyone choose haplo or mismatched over cord? Was that yes. one of your... I, I mean, yeah, I guess this is like the frustrating thing for, for a lot of us. Um, and a lot of treating physicians, and, and I, 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 because we, we know we have data that shows at least equivalency, right? And I think we all wish to get to a point where we can have a specific indication for a specific, right, where we can say which source is better rather than have biases that are infused. I mean, I think in the United States, there are just centers who, are, who have chosen a path Right, and I don't think it's necessarily like out of, well, I, I do kind of often wonder why there's so much hatred towards cord blood, but I mean, in general, I think it's, you know, our center has done research on X, so we're gonna do haplo, or our center doesn't do haplo or cord, and this new, you know, idea of using PTSI and, and a mismatch unrelated, we're gonna do that because that's what we can do. You know, at my center, um, we really weren't doing cords either. And I, I'm a pediatrician, but when I started doing my research, I knew that we need to have a cord blood program. But thankfully, I was at a center who was willing to think about the research that I was doing, allow me to start a program that spanned all ages, right? It didn't matter that I was a pediatrician. I could do adult. I could write trials that spanned all ages. And they stood behind that, and we came up with a prioritization, right? And so I benefited from having some some people who stood behind me and championed that and said, okay, all acute Lukes and X are gonna go to cord. And at that time, this was before PT Psy, the only ones who went to haplo were lymphomas, right? And so, so I had the advantage of that, um, but I, I, I hear what you're asking, and I think everyone here really wants to get to that point where we do know which donor. It's not this one or that one, it's which one is best for our patients. 
Um, and I just think there's so much bias. Uh, and maybe that is because there are still some older transplanters around. Um, maybe it's because I'm like, huh, how do I say this? Right? But I, I agree we need to get to what you're asking, right? So that people are not waiting. It kills me, kills all of us, all of us, when we hear about someone who is waiting for a transplant because they don't have a donor. Like, how many times do we hear that? And how many times do we want to pull our hair out and say, what? What is going on, right? Everyone has a donor, and it doesn't have to be a cord, right? It, everyone has a donor. I, I think it's really important to say it doesn't have to be a cord, and it's not always the same donor for each patient. They're all different scenarios, different diseases, different sizes. You know, I mean, so we have data now. We should use big data to fi figure AI to figure out what's the best donor for a patient in a given s scenario. Thank you so much. But thank you for asking that. I mean, I, yeah, we hear you. Good question. Led to a lot of discussion, so good one. Any other myths out there from the folks who might be thinking about things they interact with and would like to ask the panel? Or anything that you Or anything to, in general, yeah. since we have the, this, this panel up here. Yes. Hi. I have a myth um, that we kind of deal with on the labor floor a lot. I'm with a few of my collectors, my fellow collectors um, at Duke. Um, and we know when there's a wave of something trending on TikTok or whatever, the most recent one is we're taking these placentas to sell them for 50 grand a pop, just Wait. pure profit. And I know, I know, yes, <laughs> we get, we've been asked that direct question from multiple patients. This is so. why we need young people <laughs> like you guys, because you'll tell us non TikTokers or whatever <laughs> influencers, because we don't know. I, I didn't know that was a trend. So and you're literally getting asked that? Maybe it's happening on the black market? I don't know. We're, but, and I'd like to think, like, we wouldn't really be asking you for that if we could just take it. Anyway, <laughs> not that we're doing that, but I feel like there what needs was to be the last? some. What was the trend before that? I want to hear more. What, what was the trend before that, Melinda? <laughs> can't, you, can't you guys start your own TikTok channel? But you, you guys know in the old, old days, hospitals used to sell, I and mean, they may still do it, sell yeah. placentas for okay. cosmetics. To cosmetic companies to make, if you read the label on cosmetics, they often say extract placenta. of placenta. Now, I don't think it's 50K, no. but it was considered discarded anonymized material and sold to cosmetic companies. Well, 50 grand is the running number. No, I don't know about now. the 50 grand. <laughs> So, Not personally speaking, but... I, I think I am partly responsible for this because, um, <laughs> strangely enough, even though I refuse to use TikTok, um, but I have... In fact, I've even deleted the app from my phone. Uh, but I have a page on my website, What Is Your Placenta Worth? And it's getting a huge amount of traffic. Um, like, <laughs> I'm talking about thousands of people per month. It's like mind-boggling how much traffic it's getting. It recently went through a spike. Um, but when we talk about the placenta being worth tens of thousands of dollars, we're talking about how after a proper procurement company <laughs> has obtained it with a consent process and a sterile, you know, collection, it can then be worth that much to a medical product developer. I had to write a second article like a year or so later, can you sell your placenta? And the answer is no, you cannot. But I nonetheless am constantly getting parent inquiries, I want to sell my placenta, where should I take it? Which like begs the question, where is it now? Because it usually turns out it's in the refrigerator. So th this is a big problem that parents will have a lot of placenta misconceptions. <laughs> So if you make a dance that goes along with it and put it back on TikTok, maybe we can counteract that myth, right? Is I do think there needs to be some combatants helpfully about. I think what you guys need to be become TikToker. <laughs> you need or to us. become influencers for the court. TikToking for truth. Let, what are, TikTokers? What are you TikToking for truth? Yes. TikToking yes. For truth. Thank you. I mean, it's it's clear though that like a, a placenta and the reason it's being donated and used is a lot of interesting properties that are being researched about it. So I think that's why. Consumers are coming into it and then saying, well, if it's mine, can I, can I get something out of it? So it's a natural connection. Any other questions for our panel here? We've probably got two more minutes. One more question doesn't have to be a myth, but we have a diverse panel up here. So if there's any questions that you'd like to ask the group, we have probably time for one more. And if not, you'll get a few minutes back. Excellent. All right, I think that's it. And just once again, I'd like to thank the panel for assembling, and thank you all. Thank you.